introduce yourself and sure. what you do and you know anything you would think the public should know what's going on in the planet. Sure. Yeah, I'm Piers Chapman. I'm Head of Oceanography at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas, uh, which is 150 miles from the coast. So you may think this is a strange place to have an oceanography department, but uh, we were the oldest oceanography department in an academic institution in the country. And we celebrated our 60th anniversary last year. And uh, what I do is I, when I'm not an administrator, is I work on the hypoxia problem in the Gulf of Mexico, um, which affects the shelf of Texas and Louisiana every year. What What are you working on specifically? The, uh, the nutrient input or the effects on the marine life? Or? What we're actually trying to do is find a way of forecasting um, how the hypoxia is going to develop and how it's going to spread each year. Um, Certainly the amount of nutrients coming down the river is really important, uh, but also you have to um, count on the physical processes that go on in the Gulf. Um, the fact that you have this very low density river water coming out on top of a high salinity, high density seawater, and this forms two separate layers. And it's the formation of these two layers that cuts down the um, oxygen diffusion from the atmosphere into the sea and this is the, the main physical control on the whole hypoxic region. Could you just explain in case people might not be aware what hypoxia is? Please? Sure, hypoxia is um, a reduction in the oxygen content of seawater. And why does it occur? Why it occurs is because when the river water comes in from the Mississippi, it's laden with nutrients which come from the farms in the Midwest, they come from the um, feedlots up in Illinois, Iowa, um, just south of the Great Lakes area, and all these nutrients, because because the effluent from these uh, feedlots isn't treated. Um, you mean fat, factory farming? Factory farms? farming, yeah. Generally the um, sewage effluent isn't fully treated either. Um, and then you get a lot of nutrient runoff from the fields and um, croplands, and this all ends up in the river. And when this hits the seawater, um, it causes a bloom of phytoplankton. The phytoplankton are these small unicellular um, plant life in the sea. They produce a lot of oxygen normally, but because you have this two layer system, um, the oxygen can't diffuse downwards, can't mix downwards into the bottom high density layer. And when the phytoplankton die, they sink, and they sink into the bottom layer and start to decompose. And the decomposition process uses up oxygen. And because you have this very stable two layer system, oxygen can't diffuse downwards to counteract the amount that's been used up during the decomposition process. And so the oxygen in the bottom layer gets less and less, even though it can still be very high in the upper layer. And uh, when it gets down below a particular number, which is two milligrams per litre, um, that's what we call hypoxia. And this can have deleterious effects on the, um, the benthos, uh, the animals that live on the sediment surface or other animals that are living in that lower layer. And this isn't just an issue of the Gulf of Mexico, there's some 400 or so hypoxic zones throughout That's the world. Correct, yes. And they're growing in size and number. So um, your studies that you're doing in the Gulf of Mexico, um, do you think that they can be useful to other, other I mean, where I live, the uh, Long Island Sound has a growing hypoxic zone that grows right. from west to east. Yep. With the nutrients, we have the problem with the sewage, the septic systems. Right. Yep. Whereas you've got, and we also have nutrient input out east. So with your studies, um, you know, the sharing of information is, is so sure. integral. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the most part, yes, I mean, hypoxia has, is, is generally caused by the same physical and chemical um, factors pretty much everywhere. So you're trying to forecast what's but, going yeah, to Yeah, we're trying to forecast what's going to go on in the mm -hmm. Gulf. And in fact, in the Gulf, um, a lot depends on 
direction that the wind is blowing. And what is the forecast? For, like knowing that it's coming, what what I mean, if you had a aquaculture facility mm -hmm. that you could you know move out of the right. location or something, what what is forecasting do for the the uh, environmental effects? Well, for the most part, really, it's just used to see in the Gulf of Mexico is to see whether the in the environment as a whole is getting any better. I mean, if, if you had aquaculture facilities such as you talked about, then yes, you could use that as a means of saying, okay, the, um, you know, it's, the hypoxia is on its way, and, um, you know, you need, if you have an oyster farm, for instance, uh, the sort of things that they do down the west coast of France, um, there, if they know that something like this, like an oil spill or something is coming along, they will go out and the, the French oyster fishermen will actually remove all their cultures of oysters, and move them to somewhere else where the water is clean. Um, in Louisiana, the oysters are sort of tend to be fixed and they live in fairly brackish salinity, so they're fairly well up the estuaries. And there isn't really anywhere usually to move them to, so, and, and this has never been done there, but you could do that. Any kind of bioremediation that, uh, I mean, I know it's a huge area, but uh, any, any... We concerns? get letters from people every so often who say, oh, I have this great pumping system which will pump oxygen down into the bottom. But I mean, the problem is you're dealing with an area that stretches from the Mississippi Delta in the east, and sometimes even east of that, as far as the Texas border, which is a distance of, oh, 200, uh, sorry, 160... Uh, Two, no, 250 miles, probably. I know that, I've driven it quite frequently. <laughs> and um, so it's the scale problem. Uh, it's really very, very hard. I mean, if you can say, okay, there's going to be a hurricane coming through, that's fine. That'll stir all the water up. But because the Mississippi is continuously putting fresh water in, even within three days of the passage of a big hurricane, that two layer system will set up again and the oxygen levels at the bottom will start to go down. Well, knowing that the problem is uh, coming from man, mm -hmm. agriculture, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, man, agriculture, yeah. factory farming, is there, do you see any future in um, maybe some regulations on limiting fertilizer? I mean, people over fertilize the fields, they're becoming the fertile, the soil is less fertile, there's no nutrients in it, it's just, you know, even untillable sure. to a point. So yeah. do you see any kind of, you know, I mean, we're trying to deregulate, but any kind of regulations to help the environment to get rid of this nutrient input? It's, it's such a problem well, everywhere. I mean, yes, I mean, one can always regulate. Um, the question is, what are you going to do? I mean, people want cheap food. And so if you're, if you have a hog feedlot in Ohio, say, and you have 2,000 hogs there, which I don't know how many hogs you typically have in these yeah. situations with a lot. These hogs produce effluent every day, liquid and semi-liquid. And you've got to do something with it. What are you going to do with the effluent from 2,000 pigs, day in, day out? And that's just one unit. Um, so that's a problem. And, and, and people, since time immemorial, have used rivers to clean up their waste. Um, I think the runoff from the crops in the Midwest, I mean, it's nice, to, convenient to blame Congress for a lot of things, but in this case, the mandate to produce two billion gallons a year of biodiesel contributed directly to the hypoxia problem, because corn, this meant that all the, far the farmers were being subsidized to grow corn, and corn is a very fertilizer-hungry plant. And as you say, people tend to over-fertilize just in case. And nitrate, which is the, the, the fertilizer uh, that corn needs, dissolves in water very, very easily. And it will just run off if you have a heavy rainstorm. And it just ends up in the river. Um, you know, so from that point of view, yes, um, there are better methods of tillage, for instance. Um, and it's also been suggested that we try and recreate some of the wetlands that used to be all along the Mississippi River Valley, um, and which have all been dried out and using tile drains and you know planted with row crops. And, and a lot of these plantations go right up to the riverbank. I mean, if they just left a buffer of 20 yards or so, 
um, along the edge of the river, um, they would actually do a lot um, to alleviate the problem of runoff. Or, as I say, in certain areas, you could recreate the marshes that used to be there. Marshes will suck up a lot of nitrogen, and that will also help. Um, there's a guy at Ohio State, Bill Mitch, who's been working on this. He built himself a marsh to, to play with. Right. And he and the guy, John Day, at Louisiana State University, um, they wrote a paper saying two million acres of marsh, which sounds an awful lot, but isn't really in the context of the Mississippi River Valley, will cure most of our poxy problem. I'm not sure if their calculations are correct, but I see no reason that they shouldn't be. Thing to try, you know. <laughs> yeah, but then you're taking two million acres out of cultivation. Mm, that's okay. So. Safe <laughs> Well, possibly. <laughs> so, what other issues um, globally, rather than local to the Gulf, do you think the oceans are facing? Well, I mean, there's the perennial one of overfishing. Um, Pretty much every major fish stock is either overfished or at the limit of fishing. Um, that that's been going on for years and years, and people have known all about it. And nothing really seems to happen, unfortunately. But the next big one is going to be ocean acidification. Um, this idea that the more carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere, that will distribute itself um, among the land. Some of it's taken up by the land when plants grow. Um, some of it dissolves in the seawater and some of it remains in the atmosphere. And um, at the moment, the sea is taking up about a third of the total amount of carbon dioxide that we're putting out every year. And carbon dioxide, when it dissolves in water, forms a very weak acid. And um, acidity is measured on a logarithmic scale, the pH scale. And um, seawater generally has a pH of about to, which is slightly alkaline. Seven is neutral, and anything less than seven is acidic. And um, in the last 30 years, the pH of the surface ocean has dropped by 0.1 of a unit. Now, it doesn't sound very much, but because it's a logarithmic scale, it's actually a lot more than people think. And the estimate is it's going to drop by another 0.2 units um, in the next 30 or 40 years. And this has all sorts of ramifications because um, organisms that make shells, like oysters, mussels, clams, crabs, uh, barnacles, things like this, and a lot of the uh, very much smaller organisms as well, um, they secrete calcium carbonate shells. Now, if you go, if the ocean becomes more acidic, these shells start to dissolve. Coral reefs in another area. It's a major and if we don't do something to get control on the carbon dioxide in the surface waters of the ocean, um, very, you know, there, there could be very, very strong effects on uh, the different life, different species of organisms in the upper ocean, and we don't know quite what these are going to be. And then there's the cascading effects. And there's the cascade effect, and this could affect the whole food web in the sea and we have no idea how that's going to go. So you got any solutions for that one? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I would be uh, very rich if I could find a solution to that. Um, the problem is it's going to take a concerted effort by all the nations of the world. I mean, the US is a very major producer of carbon dioxide, but the developing nations like China and India, Brazil, they're all doing their share as well. Um, as they um, bring their populations the standard of living up to the same standard of living that we have in the Gulf, well, sorry, in America. Um, so you know, they're, they're going to want more and more of the, the good life that we have here. And that means cars and transport and central heating and, you know, and power plants and what have you. And this will going to produce more and more carbon dioxide. Um, and so unless there is a concerted action by the nations of the world. We're in trouble. Um, how long do you think the oil reserves, if they are correct in their estimates, will last? I don't know. They keep um, I mean, they, they keep, keep pushing 
um, the reserves, the amount we have in reserves forward because people keep making new discoveries. Um, but the rate we're using them up, um, at the moment the big discoveries are not keeping up with the rate at which we're using the oil. Um, I mean, then we've got coal, we've run out of oil, we've got right, coal, and coal shale. Right, coal is far more carbon dioxide. I know, this is what does. I'm saying, if we run out of the one, we just... And, I mean, oil shale is the big thing at the moment, mm -hmm. but the problem with oil shale is that it, it uses tremendous amounts of fresh water to break the rocks up. And to my mind, fresh water is probably an even more limiting resource than oil is, energy. How do we get the people, I mean, people hear it, you know, they hear it on the radio, they hear it on the television, they hear it in the news, you know, global warming, uh, climate change, you know, they do hear ocean acidification. And, you know, I would think some of them could feel, like, helpless, like, there's nothing I can do about this global problem, but, it, you know, are there things that the average person could do? We're looking hundreds of years into the future right. that, you know, if we can get control of this today, mm. this is for the future. Yeah, well, the, the, the main non-polluting source in, in, in terms of producing carbon dioxide, the main non-polluting source is nuclear power. But nuclear power itself produces a waste which we haven't yet solved right. the problem of how to deal with it. Um, I mean, it's great to think that we could have green power um, using wind, waves, geothermal, or whatever. Um, the problem with wind, of course, is that it's not predictable and it's not constant. Mm -hmm. And you know, when it gets dark at 5, 5.30 in January in Washington, D.C., you want to switch the lights on. Mm -hmm. And if the wind's not blowing and you're relying on wind power, then you're condemned to sit in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that too many people in big cities want to live like that. And um, I don't know what the solution is, frankly. Um, people you, don't want to give up their SUVs. Right. Um, way American way of life. Right. Our over consumption. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we're slowly getting used to the idea of having smaller cars, mm -hmm. recently, uh, compared to the, the great gas guzzlers with the tail fins that we used to have in the 50s. Um, but as I say, as India, China, and the other developing nations all raise their standards of living, they're all going to want the same sort of transport um, infrastructure that we have here. And, um, and you can't, I, I don't think you can deny these countries right. to say, oh, you can't have what yeah. we have because we got it first, we messed up the planet, but you can't, you can't have what we have. No. You know, I mean, it's really, really a difficult, yeah. ethical kind of Yeah, dilemma. I mean, I'm a bit pessimistic actually um, because I don't see anybody voluntarily giving up what they already have. Mm -hmm. um, they could they could do it with something like the um, chlorofluorocarbons because there were alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, but for something as basic as energy, it gets very very hard to tell someone that, no you can't have a car, or, no you can't have the lights on anymore, or, no you can't have constant running hot water. And I'm just glad I'm not sort of the president trying to trying to push this through Congress, who certainly isn't going to want to pass anything either. Have you heard that we can power America on a on a nuclear plant or something like that? Uh, I've I've heard figures. I don't know how I mean, it seems good like any of them are. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, sure, we could use a lot more solar energy than we do, especially for things like um, heating water. Uh, I don't think solar power, solar power is very much good for running air conditioners necessarily, but certainly in the home, a very large amount of power generation goes to heat water, either for your shower or for your washing machine or whatever. Um, and you could certainly use solar power for that. It would, to do it on a, a really big scale though, is probably not particularly feasible. Um, I think you're probably better off having individual units, or houses, or apartment blocks, or something like that, uh, rather than 
contract ran it in the central system, but I'm not a heating engineer, so I don't know what economy of scale could be on that. That's probably just another thing that you, you could certainly, it would certainly help. I mean, they do, people use solar panels in Alaska, for instance. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, not very it's, long. Yeah. But, um, they do use them. That's good. And, um, and so, certainly in areas like Texas, Nevada, Arizona, Southern California, as long as you're not within five miles of the coast in Southern California, because you get the fog there all the time. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah there's, a, there's a huge um, potential for increasing power generation. Hopefully, we. And hopefully we'll be able to produce better, cheaper, longer lasting uh, solar power systems than we have at the moment. Any last uh, comments you'd like to get out there to the general public? Well, um, as I said, I'm sounding very pessimistic here. Um, technology is wonderful and has produced an awful lot of advances for us and I think we'll produce a lot more um, but I think in some cases we're probably running in, up against the limits of what physics and chemistry can do um, and so I'm not sure if we can continue to maintain the same standard of living as we have at the moment and allow everybody else in the world to um, come up with that same standard um, without running into trouble. Meaning destroying the environment to the point of yeah. no return. What do you see just um, less coming for the, I mean the hypoxic zone has been shrinking, I know it goes smaller and larger, but it, but it has gotten a little bit smaller. Do you think that we could keep that up? Sorry. The, the hypoxic zone in the Gulf oh, of Mexico. Zone, sorry, yeah. I know, I'm jumping from yeah, topic yeah. to topic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think it it can. I mean, there is there's been quite a lot of work in the last five or ten years on trying to get trying to teach farmers the best uh, management practices for their land, and this has reduced the amount of nitrogen coming down the river uh, to some extent. So a lot of um, public education. So yeah, public education will work. Um, the the problem is it's going to take a long time, A, because farming is very conservative normally anyway, um, and B, because there's a sort of residual amount of organic matter in the Gulf, um, and this just continues to decompose over time, and you've got to work that out of the system before you can um, expect the oxygen levels to start going up again. I mean, they get renewed every winter. Um, when the whole when the storm fronts come through, and this churns the whole water up. Um, but um, again, there's still um, organic matter in the sediments in the Gulf, um, and these act to um, reduce the oxygen. And once there's two, that system sets up again. What about extensive seaweed farming to try to absorb some of those nutrients and clean it up a little bit? Um, seaweeds don't grow very well on sandy and muddy bottoms. Well, you can do those floating kind of. Yeah, but they've still got to be attached to something. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the one of the best things that we had were the oyster reefs, mm -hmm. um, but we dredged them up in the south of Louisiana, and dredged them all up and used them to build roads. Um, and now those most of those reefs are no more, mm -hmm. um, which is unfortunate because the oysters are very very effective and very efficient at filtering stuff out. And that includes both sediment particles and phytoplankton and whatever, and they feed on phytoplankton. And um, so the reefs were actually nourished to a large extent by the, by the nutrients coming down the river. Um, but when I say the reefs don't exist any longer, so and rebuilding them would be quite a difficult uh, problem. Reason for your pessimism. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I hope I don't disappoint your uh, viewers too much. You know, you got to get all, all the yeah. viewpoints, you know. it's uh, There's some doom and gloom and there's some no. success stories. So, it's 
what this conference is all about. I think getting all the uh, brilliant people together and put some things into action. Anyway, huh. Thank you. Okay, Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a okay. great night. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Thank you.